Beautiful, Rick. Beautiful, Rick. Thank you so much. Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Sunday. It's Julie and I had a wonderful uh, vacation in uh, beautiful Kauai, and, and uh, it, it's just I still have visions of it, you know, kind of running through my my head and my mind, and just feeling a fullness of the, the spirit of the island, and it's just an amazing, uh, magical kind of place that we've experienced, and so I was grateful for the opportunity to, to, to vacate. That's what vacation means, right? So it was nice to vacate for a while, and vacate's a great word. It really kind of implies just emptying, and I really felt it was a good experience for releasing and letting go and trusting and really moving into a place of just openness and that experience. And while I was there, I was really praying about, um, you know, what, what are the lessons and what are the gifts and what are the things that I would need to learn and what are the things that I need to share. And, and I kept really being brought back to a very powerful teaching in unity that's based on the works of our co-founder, Charles Fillmore, called The Twelve Powers of Man. How many of you have actually read this book? A few of you, yeah. It is absolutely, in my opinion, one of some of the, the deepest, but also some of the most practical spiritual teachings that I've ever come across. And um, it's sometimes a little challenging for folks to read because Charles Fillmore didn't actually write it as a book. It was actually taken from many of his talks. And so it was compiled as a book sometime afterwards or may, perhaps during his, his time. And, uh, and Charles, of course, were, uh, lived at a time when the language was, a, interestingly enough, a little different than it is today. And so it's kind of a flowery language, but it's really uh, so profound in many of its awarenesses and teachings. And I also have recently uh, come across a wonderful work from one of our neighbors down here, um, Linda Martella Whitsett, who's the minister at Unity in Austin, wrote an amazing, wonderful book called Divine Audacity, which really takes and expounds upon the ideas and teachings of Charles Fillmore and the Twelve Powers of Man. And so it came to me that I really want everyone in our group to really to get some of these understandings and awarenesses because we are each being called to follow the teachings of Jesus, but not just follow the teachings of Jesus, but to really move into an awareness and a consciousness that Jesus himself lived and represented and created. So it's not just simply listening to the teachings, but it's beginning to move into an energy and a consciousness of the Christ nature that is within every one of us. I came across, uh, this is a story that I, uh, it's actually, a, I remember it as a, a cartoon, but there were two caterpillars that were uh, crawling along and one looks up and sees a butterfly. And he says to the other one, you'll never get me up in one of those. <laughs> well, unfortunately, sometimes we kind of have that mindset of it's not possible for us to be, perhaps be in that place. But the reality is that's the caterpillar's nature to truly be a butterfly, and that is your nature. You are created in the image and after the likeness of the divine. I am created in the image and after the likeness of the divine, and our work is really to allow that to emerge and to unfold in us in ways that allow us to be, as Jesus said, the light of the world. I was reading uh, Linda's book, and it's a wonderful book called Divine Audacity. Divine Audacity. And if you have an opportunity, anybody here read that one? If you get a chance, that's a great one. Follow along with us on it because it's really a great work to really help you to, to develop the spiritual qualities of that divine nature, of that Christhood. And she says that enlightenment is temporary. It's moment by moment. Have you ever noticed that in one moment you can be totally connected, heart-centered, and free, but a moment later when a driver swerves a car into your parking spot that you were trying to pull into and waiting for, you become, well, as she says, let's just say enlightenment comes and goes. <laughs> so it's a valuable awareness, you know, and you've heard me say that you know, people have got uh, the story of the, the, the monk that goes to the, the master and, and says, well, how is it that you're always so centered? Never centered, always returning to center. So it's a valuable understanding to recognize that you and I are always in a spiritual process. 
We're in a spiritual process, and that process is something that we can participate in in a conscious way, and that's really part, uh, part of what we're really called to do. So we practice, uh, the practice makes moments of enlightenment much more likely. As we practice, uh, it builds neural pathways to increase that likelihood of enlightenment moments. Um, and so nevertheless, we, uh, we, the most practiced masters oftentimes fall off of that pl plane of enlightenment. And as at times, you can experience uh, a, a loss of an awareness of our true nature and identity. We all do. So part of our work is to remind ourselves and each other who we truly are. And that's a big piece of why we are in connection and relationship with each other, believe it or not. It's not um, always, um, interestingly enough, one of my teachers, Ram Das, used to say that relationships are the highest yoga because we learn more about ourselves in our relationships than just about any other way. And the question really is, are we really learning our true nature and our true selves in our relationships? Or are we actually learning what we're not and beginning to practice what we're not. Every one of us is capable of expressing in any moment something of the nature of the divine. And our practice of this makes it even more available to us and makes it more capable, uh, makes us more capable of, of really, really attuning to it and then coming from that space and that place. So one of our, a big part of our work is to really practice being what Jesus called us. What did Jesus call us? He said, you are the light of the world. Now, he said, I am the light of the world. But he also, what people don't sometimes miss is the second part of that. They, he miss, we miss sometimes that he said, I am the light of the world. But he also said, you are the light are the light of the world. He was talking to you personally. I want you to know that. You are the light of the world. How often do we really come from and live from that energy and that consciousness and that space? Well, I would suggest to you that it's always there, it's always available, and it's always there in possibility and in potential. And we are living out the process of living into that space of being the light of the world. With practice, we can instinctively know what to think and say or do to amplify that light in our lives and our spiritual capacities in any circumstance, in any circumstance. And so um, one of the things that Linda says is that uh, post-religious New Thought teachings sometimes give the impression that we can get spiritual enough to eliminate all unwanted circumstances in our lives. Well, this is not the purpose of spiritual, spirituality, though. See, even the greats, Jesus, Gandhi, Mandela, for example, never managed to eliminate unwanted circumstances in their life. Do you realize that? And so if you recognize that it's not about trying to eliminate unwanted circumstances, it really is about trying to be the presence of the divine even in the midst of those unwanted circumstances. She says it's walking through those unwanted circumstances with an awareness of who and what we truly are. Our one identity can be our first resource rather than our last resource. And the intention of this is study is to develop our spiritual nature and practice it in such a way that we walk through unwanted circumstances in the same way that we walk through wanted circumstances with a, a real connection with our true being, with our true nature. So it, it's, it's a, an important and valuable uh, practice to keep us back into that place where we know the truth of who and what we are and to come from that space in whatever is going on in life. She gives some great examples that I really uh, appreciate, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about. Um, in December 2012, Kenyan Abel Mutai was about to win a cross-country race in Navarre, Spain. Just behind him ran Spanish athlete Ivan Fernandez Anaya, for whom a win would mean a place on the Spanish team for the European Championships. 
So Anaya was surprised when Mutai came to a stop 10 meters short of winning, mistaking his stopping point for the finish line. Anaya caught up with his competitor and astonished onlookers when instead of taking advantage of Matei's mistake, Anaya guided Matai forward to win the race. Came up on him, could have passed him, pointed out to him, no, it's up there, and let him go ahead and finish and win the race. In Belleville, Michigan, there was a business owner named Bob Thompson. And his road building company, and uh, he sold his road building company in July of 1999. When the deal was done, he notified his 550 employees that they would share in the 128 million proceeds from the sale of his company. Thompson gave hourly workers generous amounts in cases exceeding their annual pay. He presented salary workers who had no pension, one to two million each in certificates available upon their retirements. And to ensure they received the full million or more, he also paid the taxes on their windfalls. Bob's rationale, I wanted to go out a winner, and I wanted to go out doing the right thing. A powerful example. Kyle Maynard was, has competed in wrestling and mixed martial arts set records in weightlifting and reached the summit of Mount Kilimanjaro, all without forearms and lower legs. Kyle was born with a congenital quadruple amputation. An inspiring author, athlete, and motivational speaker, Kyle encourages wounded warriors to stretch beyond physical limitations and to achieve their goals. Kyle's mantra and book and title is No Excuses. These are amazing and powerful examples of people demonstrating what's possible. And that possibility exists within each and every one of us. And there are qualities and characteristics that you see demonstrated by these wonderful examples. And part of what Linda is encouraging and challenging us to do is to own these qualities and characteristics for ourselves. And this is what she refers to as divine audacity. Having the audacity to be the spiritual person that we know ourselves to be. To living from that time and that energy and that space and that consciousness of knowing the truth of our divine nature. And what allows us to do that is simply the practice of doing it, is moving into that in a consistent way and practicing the qualities and characteristics that move us out of our limiting thoughts and attitudes and beliefs, our judgments, our fears, our anxieties, our littleness, our pettiness. There's an amazing greatness that exists in each and every human heart and mind, and part of our unfolding is learning how to tap into that in ways that we haven't before. Talked about being the light of the world. I came across another little nice little story that, about a boy who forgot his lines in the Sunday school presentation. His mother was in front in the front row to prompt him. Thank you, mom. She gestured and formed the words silently with her lips, but he didn't. He still didn't quite get it, and so his son's memory was just a blank. He didn't. He didn't really get what, what he was supposed to say. And finally, she leaned forward and whispered, "The cue. I am the light of the world." And the child beamed with great joy and stood up and pronounced, my mother is the light of the world. <laughs> well, the young man got it right. And yet, that's only part of the story. And the other part of the story, the important, also another important part of the story, is to recognize that understanding of I am the light of the world. And so I'm going to ask you to just say something with me. Would you be willing to know that for yourself? I am the light of the world. Together? I am the light of the world. Just breathe that in and out for a moment. And just notice if anything comes up in you that says, yeah, but... And what we're really about also is 
learning how to let go of those yeah buts. And that's one of our spiritual qualities that we'll cover later on, is learning how to let go of anything that stands in the way of truly knowing and feeling that awareness of our true divine nature and what we're here to be about. You are the light of the world. Jesus' audacious statement reveals a truth embedded within met a metaphor commonly used in his day and also even used today. So let's talk about light just a little bit. Light really represents the divine. It represents in almost every religion in some form, in some way, some aspect of the divine, usually having to do with a, an awareness of understanding, of, of consciousness, of, of um, intelligence, of... It is some aspect of, our, of the one mind. And light is a wonderful metaphor. There are times, there's so many times that the light, word light is used in Scripture, and sometimes it's used literally to mean the light that we see here. And yet oftentimes it's used figuratively, figuratively to, rec, to represent, to show something that is ultimately invisible to the eye, but is a quality and a characteristic and even a vibration which all things are, you realize that, don't you? Everything in this universe, everything in this world ultimately is a vibration. It's an energy, and we're a part of that. And so the light is really a representation of that knowing and that understanding. And so there's an awareness and a consciousness that is within each and every one of us that moves us beyond our limited views and form, of form and, and of limited self, small self, and there's a higher self with a capital S that really is the I am, the divine nature, the Christ within. The Hebrew word for Jehovah translated in these scriptures, Lord, means the self-existent one. Think of Jehovah or the Lord as the I am or spiritual consciousness at the heart of you and me. The I am is our divine identity, our unity with our source. The I am is our eternal beingness, and the spiritual consciousness arose most notably in the consciousness of Jesus the Christ, the central figure of the New Testament. Jesus is equated with God, and the I am with light, and therefore Jesus becomes known as the light of the world. But stunningly, Jesus did not regard himself alone as the light. He acknowledged the divine the origin of the light, the father of lights. He recognizes himself as God's light. He also says to you and me, you are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one after lighting a lamp puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand it gives light to all in the house. And in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. But the light that is the essence of our nature, that light that is our true being, first has to be acknowledged. It has to be, we have to admit the light and we also have to allow the light. And so to acknowledge the light, we, we acknowledge that there is one presence and one power in this universe. There is an allness that is in everywhere. There's a oneness. There's a, a divine unity. There's a great spirit. There's a, a, the one source, the one mind. We acknowledge that. We recognize it. We allow ourselves to be attuned to that knowing that we're, we are immersed in this one presence and one power, that we are an aspect of it. We're part of it and that it is part of us. It's not our personality. It is our essence. It is the very power. It is the one power that we talk about. So we acknowledge that one presence, but then we also need to be willing to admit our own connection with it. According to Witsit, the words, uh, she gives this wonderful quote John, from John 14, 10 through 12, the words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own. This is Jesus speaking. But the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. 
Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do and, in fact, will do greater works than these. Greater works than these. This is John 14, 10 through 12. So Jesus admits that his authority comes from the divine, comes from the Father, our source, but he also points out that you have that same connection, that same source, that you are an expression of that as well. So we allow the light, the source, to reflect it. And one of the ways that we grow into that, there is an awareness that, in the words of spiritual teacher Michael Beckwith, we allow ourselves to, um, in order to really truly experience the, um, an expression of the light, we have to allow the light as well. And this is a powerful word, and the word allowing, uh, it's often thought of as surrender. Sometimes people have some not real positive connotations about the word surrender, but I'm going to suggest to you that it's actually in almost every spiritual teaching. If you are open to really learning from different spiritual teachers, you'll find that this idea of surrender is, is, is um, in almost every faith tradition. It's, it's an allowing for something more to come through. Every faith tradition values surrender as a key heightened spirituality. Allowing it is allowing ourselves to be. It's even more than we thought ourselves to be and more than our past says that we are. And surrender at its best comprises two distinct actions, releasing not only the human limitation, but also yielding to our spiritual nature, to our divine identity. So releasing is one of our spiritual qualities, and so part of what we're learning is to let go and allow ourselves to be who we truly are. In other words, as my, uh, spiritual teacher Michael Beckwith says, surrender is freedom from the bondage of our ego consciousness. We free ourselves from living in the neurotic consciousness of me, myself, and I. And the second activity of surrender is yielding to our spiritual nature or our divine identity. We give way for the wisdom of the self to arise in our, in our awareness. So the spiritual qualities that we talk about, we talk about, let me read this, actually, let me read you this quote from, from Charles Filmer, our co-founder of Unity. This is from Jesus Christ Healed. He says, God, this may shock some of you. It may not, but it may shock some of you. God does not love anybody or anything. Blasphemy, you say. God does not love anybody or anything. He goes on to say, God is the love in everybody and everything. God is love. Man becomes loving by permitting that which God is to find expression in word and in act. So he's referring to an understanding of these these principles, that love is a principle. And interestingly enough, love exists whether we know it or are aware of it or not. Are you, can you get that? It exists whether we know it or are aware of it or not, but our tuning into it allows us to know it and, and experience it and to express it. And so likewise, God is faith and understanding and will and imagination and zeal and power and wisdom and strength and order and release and life. God is faith and we're going to move into an understanding about this idea of faith. All of these are spiritual qualities, and they are inherent in our very being, and yet we also need to awaken to them and to develop them and to allow them to develop in and through us. And so let's talk a little bit about this idea of faith. Faith, according to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. I love that verse. And another wonderful quote that I always like to refer to in Keep a True Lent, Charles Fillmore says, faith is the perceiving power of the mind linked with a power to shape substance. It is spiritual assurance, the power to do the seemingly impossible. It is a force that draws to us our heart's desire right out of the invisible spiritual substance. 
It is a deeper inner knowing that that which is sought is already ours for the taking, the assurance of things hoped for. It's already ours for the taking, a powerful gift and tool that we have to work with in our lives. Faith is a power that makes it possible the real. Our very sense of reality depends on faith. It is the power that realizes, that is, that makes real images that we hold in our consciousness. It is. It exists whether we have, uh, 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 whether we're tuning into it or not, whether we are conscious of whether we're using it or not, we are using our faculty of faith in some form, in some way. You realize that? You're whether you know it or not, you're actually using it right now. It's actually what's holding in your seat right now. Some people think it's gravity, but I'm going to suggest to you that it's actually faith. <laughs> you have faith in the gravity, perhaps. Otherwise, you wouldn't have tried to sit. It's a pretty basic and simple kind of idea, but you have to have that kind of faith to even take the action of sitting into a chair, don't you? You have to have the faith that that chair is going to be there. You have to have the faith that it's going to support you. Sound familiar? We use the same kind of faith to allow ourselves to sit into a consciousness of the divine presence and light and love and grace in our lives. It's something that, that as we practice it, it really becomes automatic to us. And so we don't even recognize sometimes that we're doing it. But we also don't sometimes recognize when we are putting our faith in something that is really not a part of our unique divine nature. When we're putting our faith in our limitations, when we're putting our faith in our scarcity, we're putting our faith in the appearances in life and in the world. We're putting our faith in our opinions and our judgments. We're putting our faith in the circumstances rather than recognizing that the circumstances are an outpicturing of our use or misuse of our faith. Right? So faith is that innate power to create our reality by our perceptions. And so Linda points out that there are three aspects of faith, and I want to gently and somewhat quickly go through these different aspects. First of all, one of the aspects of faith is our perception. You see, our faith is based upon our perception, it's, which is our awareness or our consciousness. We experience our reality formed with how we interpret what we are seeing and experiencing in our lives. Our observations about life and our impressions about the world's states of affairs and our beliefs accumulated through the years become the foundation, the basis of what we're putting our faith in. I call it our programming. We get programmed on how we're going to use that faculty of faith. And sometimes our programming doesn't allow us to express that faith as the essence and truth of who and what we are, but in all of the other definitions that those around us, the world, and even ourselves have taken on in the belief of who and what we are. Our perception is so critical to our experience of our reality that it would be wise for us to always question our perception, to seek a greater awareness of the truth of the situation, the truth of the circumstance, the truth of the person, the truth of ourselves, to always question our perception. You see, two particular perceptions support powerful faith. Our perception of the absolute truth of our being, our spiritual nature, our spiritual principles, and an underlying all-too-human material condition, our perceptions of our possibilities, our perceptions of our limitations. Winifred Wilkinson Hausman has a wonderful saying from of the book, Your God-Given Potential. Faith is that quality in us which enables us to look past appearances of lack, limitation, or difficulty to take hold of the divine idea and believe in it even though we do not see any evidence of it except in our mind. And through faith we know with an inner knowing the truth that has not yet expressed in our manifest world. It's the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen. Holding an energy and an awareness 
of that which we desire in our heart, of that which we intend, that's which we, we want to draw into our experiences, not as though it's something in the future, but recognizing that it already exists in the possibilities in the spiritual realm, draws it into our experience and recognizing it as, as something that already exists actually draws it even more quickly into knowing that it's real. And into that knowing draws it into actual manifestation. Our power to perceive extends not only to, it extends to future possibilities. We have too often defined our future possibilities by our current and past circumstances. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You look at your past circumstances and you think that that's all that there is. You think that's all that's possible? You think that's all that's capable? But I'm going to suggest to you that is a misuse of your faculty of faith because your possibilities are not in any way limited by any past circumstances or anything that's going on in your current circumstances today. And that's one of the values of the faculty of faith is being willing and able to look beyond the appearances and see the possibilities of something greater, of something more. Possibilities exist in the invisible realm, and yet in the unformed state of mind. And the wielder of great, uh, Sheree Carter Scott says, the wielder of the greatest power of faith is one who not only perceives possibilities, but also views the impossible as possible. Who views the impossible as possible. I dare say, I love the th story from Alice who says, well, that's impossible. And the response is, well, I dare say you haven't had much practice believing the impossible. <laughs> See, uh, another aspect of, of faith that uh, is being presented is the idea of conviction. Conviction in the, is the mindset of faith. Conviction is trust, assurance, confidence. It is the fruit of trust. It is, and it, it, the fruits of trust are a peaceful state of being, a peaceful mind. There was a great story of a farmer who was uh, hiring a potential farmhand, and his only um, self-stated success was that I, I can sleep through the night. I can sleep through a storm. He says, I can, I can sleep through a storm. Well, the man needed, he liked the young man, and he needed someone to really help him, so he went ahead and hired him, and as he was uh, hired him, he, he, um, one night a storm did come up, and he's calling to his, this young man to come help him and discovers he's sound asleep, so the farmer goes out, and what he discovers is that the barn is all locked up, the animals are put away, the the sh they're fed, uh, you know, the tractor's been put away and everything. Everything is as it should be. And so then in that moment, he understood what the young man meant when he said, I can sleep through a storm. Because he does the work and the practice to make sure that all that is necessary is taken care of. It's a conviction of knowing that all things are working together and that you've done what you need to do and that the universe is doing what it needs to do. Living in conviction is living from a prepared consciousness and trust the tr and in the truths of the, of the possibilities and the principles of, of grace and goodness and, and life that is working and flowing in and through you. It's living in a knowing that there is an energy and a power that is greater than your limited thinking that will allow amazing things to happen in and through you when you align yourself to it. In the Adam Smashing Power of Mind, Charles Fillmore says, faith is the highest expression of our belief of, or confidence. It is that something in man that says, I believe in the possibilities of things that I cannot see. I believe in the possibility of divine mind doing in this age right now everything that has ever done in any age. And when we believe this and hold to it, putting it aside, all doubt whatsoever, suggest, suggestions of failure, the thoughts of faith begin to accumulate substance and fulfill, and fulfillment follows. 
So living in conviction is knowing that what you are praying for and about already is. It's done. It's a done deal. You're in it. It's immersing yourself in it. I love the story. Uh, there was a story of a small farming community that uh, was experience, had experienced drought for a number of years. We've done that here in this area. And, you know, in the farming community, if there's a drought, there's no crops and there's no funds, there's no food for that matter. And so the minister of the town brought together all of the different people in the town, in the town square, one of the ministers, and it was people from all faiths. And one of the things that he did was he looked out and he saw this young girl in the crowd. And he stopped a moment and he asked the young girl to come forward. And he asked the whole congregation to look at this young girl. He said, I want you to pray with the same faith that this young girl has. And as he did so, he pointed out that the young girl was wearing her galoshers, was wearing a raincoat, and was holding an umbrella. <laughs> so when you pray, when you hold a vision for the desires in your heart, are you holding your umbrella? Are you knowing, are you having that expectancy of good? Are you having the expectancy of what it is that you are, is the desires of your heart coming into your experience? You see, expectancy is another aspect of faith. Faith is demonstrated by a general sense of joyous anticipation. I expect things to go well. I expect to know how to respond in the moment. I expect to act from my intentionality, I expect uh, to, to respond from my divine nature. If I expect those things, then I will begin to practice and know that those things will begin to move into my energy and I will begin to experience and express more of that nature in all aspects of my life. And so I want to read to you in closing a wonderful prayer from Dorothy Pearson, a wonderful unity minister called o Expectation. Oh God, I will enjoy this day. My expectation is of good. I am open to the new thought, new, though it may not yet be understood. If I find myself in a place I have not seen before, though I cannot see the outcome, I will trust you even more. The day I set my mind in tune with your loving care, I will enjoy this day and look for you everywhere. Let's move into our meditation time. So let's take a nice deep breath now as we move into our meditation time and just breathe into that space of the heart. And as you breathe into that heart space, Allow your breath to be calm, to still. And just take a moment now to focus your attention now on the center of your forehead, inward, at the side of the pineal gland, located between the two hemispheres of your brain. And breathing in and breathing out, Allow your attention to be fixed and focused in this area. This is an area that is associated and connected with the energy, the power of faith. And I bless this connecting link between the physical and the spiritual world. I allow myself to be sensitive to the pulsing of life, the movement of energy and shine a royal blue light of faith into the very center of the brain. And to see the, the spaces between the hemispheres brushed with this beautiful blue light and broadcast blue light throughout your brain and down through your body And now see a healing, streaming, royal blue signifying your consciousness of faith. Faith is the ability to see what cannot be seen humanly. To activate the spiritual power 
courageously, perceiving a greater truth than the physical senses can show or report. And just dare yourself to see what cannot be seen by human eyes, but exist as surely as the sun exists behind a cloud. We perceive the bottom line truth about life. That life is irrepressible, eternal, perfect in every stage and form. And so take a moment to stretch your capacity to see the good and the good that can be seen even in troubling circumstances and situations. Be open to envisioning and looking beyond the appearances to see the possibilities of yourself and even seeming possible, impossible circumstances. And just say to yourself, I am devoted to perceiving the good that can be and that is unfolding even in the midst of this. And I know, I'm convinced of the unseen good, the animating, harmonizing, and creative power behind all that is and all that I have experienced in my being, all that is in my true nature. And just gently affirm and know and be open and receptive to allowing a knowing I am a divine being. I am a spiritual being. I reach inward to that place in me that truly knows and has the faith to remain faithful in even those challenging times of my true nature. Allowing my humanness as well as my divineness helps me to know my wholeness. I demonstrate a conviction by living from this space. As love lives, as wholeness lives, as wisdom lives, I choose to live and be a light, the light of the world. Just gently affirm that for yourself. And know that by the innate power of faith, living in positive expectancy, centering our attention on joyous possibilities and anticipations, knowing the truth, all is well. Breathe that into the heart space now. And as you breathe it in the heart space, see it in the very center of your head and give thanks. And so it is. Move into, take another nice deep breath now. And as you breathe in, allow yourself to move back into this room, this time, this place. Take another nice deep breath and when you're ready, gently open your eyes and give thanks for the unfolding Christ power of faith in you this day. And so it is.